Now that we know how to improve the steady state error via cascade compensation, we want to turn our attention to how to improve the transient response via cascade compensation. And so typically when we're doing this, our design goal is going to be to decrease our settling time, T sub S, while maintaining a certain percent overshoot. And so we can think about what this looks like in our complex plane. So if we have our real axis sigma and our imaginary axis j omega, remember that a constant percent overshoot is going to correspond to some radial line. So this could be percent overshoot one, for instance. And so what we're saying is we want to decrease our settling time. And so remember, settling time is going to correspond to vertical lines in our complex plane. So we could say this was maybe our initial settling time was TS1, and now we want to reduce that settling time. So we're going to move further left in our S plane. So if this corresponds to TS2, this would be TS2 less than TS1. And so, of course, the, the goal then is how do we actually move our root locus so that pole location is moving from this initial point to the secondary point. And so we can also see in this, this diagram that we're actually decreasing our peak time as well because our point is going to be moving up on our imaginary axis and horizontal lines corresponded to constant peak time. But typically the settling time is going to be a, a, a parameter that is, we're more interested in. And so if you want to review sort of the relationships between these parameters and the S-plane, again, you can see that on page 151 in the 8th edition textbook. So we're going to be looking at two methods to achieve this transient response improvement with cascade compensation. The first is with an ideal derivative compensation or ideal derivative compensator. So ideal derivative compensation. And so in this case, what we're going to have is we're going to have a proportional signal and a derivative signal, just like sort of parallel into what we did with our integral signal. So we still need that proportional signal as well. So we're going to have proportional plus derivative. So we're going to call this a PD controller. And so a couple things to note about this ideal derivative compensation is just like with our ideal integral compensation, this is going to be implemented using active components. And so remember there is a section in the textbook that talks about how we actually implement these compensators. And so in this case, our active components are our op amps. Um, and we're gonna talk about in a second as opposed to our passive components, which are just resistors, inductors, and capacitors. Um, so I've got an extra T in there, so active components, there we go. Um, and so remember our active components are going to be a little bit more expensive, but typically are going to provide better performance. Another thing to keep in mind anytime we're doing derivation in signals is that we need to be careful with noise. So just inherently differentiation can be a noisy process. So differentiation is noisy. So we need to be on the lookout for unwanted signals. And so we might have to filter some signals out. We might have to have some extra considerations there. And so the reason for that is uh, maybe our signal is relatively big. Um, <clears throat> and so we can kind of forget, ignore the fact of, of what all is going on in terms of the controlling circuitry. But maybe we have, for instance, a sine wave that is our intended signal that we're controlling. But if we have some noise signal, you know, typically it's going to be a much smaller amplitude. So if we have some proportional gain, it's, it's not going to affect us too much because, you know, obviously our desired signal here is much larger amplitude than our derivative, or sorry, of our, our noise signal. So this would be our noise. However, if we sort of zoom in on one piece of this, so if we zoom in on that, what we might see is that there are relatively large sort of rates of change in there. So once we take the derivative, we might have large values. Um, so that's what we want to be careful about sort of extra noise coming in when we're, anytime we're using differentiation. Um, what we're going to see too is we're going to have a reduction of root locus branches crossing into the right half plane. And so we'll see that more clearly with an example here in a little bit. So reduction of root locus branches. And so of course that's ideal because that's going to give us more flexibility in terms of uh, gain values that are going to result in stability of our system.
So reduction of root locus branches crossing into right half plane. So that's our first method we're going to look at. The second method we're going to look at is analogous to our lag compensator that we considered previously. And this is going to be a lead compensator. And so <clears throat> the basic goal is the same as with our ideal, <clears throat> excuse me, our ideal derivative compensator, except here we're going to be implementing this with passive components. So passive components, cheaper, cheaper and simpler. Um, however, maybe don't provide quite as, as good a performance as our active components. Uh, one advantage though in doing that is we're going to have a reduction in our, uh, in our noise compared to the P PD controller. So noise effects from our differentiation are going to be reduced compared to our PD controller. And so over the following videos, we're gonna take a look at examples of each of these types of controllers. One thing to keep in mind as well is that we're only going to have time, at least as of the time of making this video, to consider cascade compensation but you can look further in your textbook and you can see that we can also improve our transient response or our steady state error using feedback compensation.